This micro lecture is on pyrolysis. When you have a chance, please look at the attached link on a very advanced wood stove. This stove is known as the Wham Autopilot, and it won most innovative design at the 2013 Wood Stove Decathlon competition. In some ways, this may be the future of wood stoves because it measures combustion conditions through the use of oxygen sensors and thermocouples, and then uses the data for a control system. An onboard computer allocates combustion air in a precise manner to achieve the best possible burn. The stove not only controls combustion automatically, it also allows you to set the room temperature to the required level with the help of a remote control, which even tells you when to refuel your stove. For those that want it, there is also software and apps so that the stove can be monitored or controlled with your phone or computer, and there is also an interface that allows you to read off technical combustion data. This kind of control was previously only available for things like natural gas, but now it is possible with wood stoves as well. With something like pellet fuel that can be used very precisely, a heating system like this would not only save a great deal of money, but it would also be very simple to use and automated. Worth paying attention to. Please take a moment to review this week's learning objectives. This week we are covering thermal conversions, our second biomass conversion pathway type. Thermal conversion of biomass breaks big molecules into small molecules. Thermal conversion does not make things, it really just breaks them down. This means if you want to make large sized chemicals, or chemicals that don't look like small pieces of lignin and cellulose, thermal conversion cannot be the only conversion utilized, or shouldn't even be the conversion of choice. This is especially relevant with pyrolysis, as the products look very much like small pieces of cellulose and lignin. Thermal conversion of biomass does not make oil. Pyrolysis oil is often called bio-oil. This is a silly naming convention because pyrolysis oils look nothing like oils chemically. They have an entirely different set of organic chemistries, almost entirely the opposite of what oils like petroleum and vegetable oil have. The name bio-oil was coined because it was a thick, dark product that looked like oil, not because it actually was oil. Based on that kind of logic, molasses and liquid chocolate should also be called oils. At this point, we are stuck with the misleading name bio-oil, but it is important to remember it is only called oil because of how it looks sometimes, not because it has anything in common with real oils. So we covered combustion and gasification, and now we are on to pyrolysis. There are three major types based on three process conditions, speed, pressure, and solvents. We will go through examples of all three. Like we mentioned previously, cooking food is full of thermal conversions. This is especially apparent when it's pyrolysis because the food begins to brown, and then if you cook it too much, it will blacken. This progression happens because certain food molecules are going through pyrolysis, and some are charring, which makes things black. If you think about thermal conversions as a breakdown process, cooking food starts to make sense in other ways. When we cook our food, we often break it down a little, and that makes it easier to eat which is why we cook it. This is a fairly complex looking graphic of biomass breakdown during pyrolysis. It is one of my favorite figures for trying to visualize what happens during pyrolysis. To start, the things at the bottom left are biomass cells. At around 400 degrees Celsius, pyrolysis begins and the cells start to change because their cell walls are being thermally broken down. By around 500 degrees Celsius, little gas bubbles made of steam and volatile organics have started to form inside the cell walls. By 800 degrees Celsius, the bubbles have grown so much that the cell has expanded, it is basically being inflated by the gas bubbles that are rapidly forming and growing. By 900 degrees Celsius, the cell wall can no longer contain the vapors and they burst out of the cell wall and into the space around the cell. This leaves a fairly clean char molecule that has almost no low molecular weight organics remaining. They have all been volatilized. What this figure doesn't show is that those bubbles are bursting the entire time, just not as grandly as they do by 900 degrees Celsius. From 400 degrees Celsius onward, the heat and conditions that generate the bubbles in the cell wall are also causing parts of the cell wall to disintegrate into various pyrolysis vapors. 
These vapors can be condensed to form what we call bio-oil. There are some general rules to pyrolysis shown by the red arrows at the bottom. Usually, pyrolysis that occurs at a low temperature like 400 degrees Celsius produces bio-oils that are rich in oxygen, which is a bad thing. This is because there has not been enough thermal conversion to generate a lot of water and carbon dioxide. However, if your pyrolysis occurs at a higher temperature, like 900 degrees Celsius, then your bio-oil usually has a lower oxygen content, which is good. Likewise, pyrolysis done at lower temperatures generate less gas and more condensable liquids, so you get more bio-oil for every pound of biomass. This stands in contrast to pyrolysis done at high temperatures, which generates more gas and less condensable liquids, leaving you with low yields but maybe a higher quality bio-oil product. This figure gives us a lot to think about, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Faster heating rates make more liquids, and slower heating rates make more solids. So if you want to produce bio-oil, fast pyrolysis is more ideal. And if you want to produce biochar or charcoal, slow pyrolysis is more ideal. Combining fast pyrolysis and oil refining catalysts can be done to produce a low oxygen content bio-oil that can be upgraded to gasoline and diesel blend stock using lots and lots of hydrogen. This would be fine, but hydrogen is very expensive, and this presents a major economics challenge to bioenergy businesses trying to turn fast pyrolysis oil into gasoline. Fast pyrolysis is often chosen because it yields the most bio-oil, but like we just learned, this also means the quality of the bio-oil is frequently lower. Slow pyrolysis produces a better product, but with poor yields per pound of biomass, and this can make it very expensive to use. There are always trade-offs. Higher pressures tend to make higher quality bio-oils, but lower pressures tend to make more bio-oils. So once again, there's a trade-off. High pressure pyrolysis can be used to produce a very low oxygen content bio-oil without catalysts. This crude bio-oil can then be sent to an oil refinery if wanted. High pressure pyrolysis, particularly something called hydrothermal liquefaction pyrolysis, is becoming a very popular pyrolysis technique because the bio-oil that is produced is fairly high quality and the process works very well with wet algal biomass and wastewater sludge. The downside is that the pressures can be in the 2,000 to 3,000 PSI range and that is extremely high pressure for an industrial process. It is achievable, but it is also very expensive and dangerous. So once again, there are trade-offs. Supercritical liquefaction pyrolysis and solvent liquefaction pyrolysis are unusual methods but worth mentioning because they have been considered at the commercial scale and they generate an extremely high quality bio-oil. A solvent is something that dissolves something and turns it into a liquid solution, like when you dissolve sugar cubes in a glass of water, the water is acting as a solvent. It is much harder to dissolve sugar cubes in a glass of canola oil because canola oil is not a good solvent for sugar, but water is. The idea behind this pyrolysis technique is that you heat biomass in a solvent at very high temperatures and pressures. Under these conditions, there are solvents that will dissolve biomass into its pieces and then further break these pieces down into a bio-oil. The value of doing this is that the quality of the bio-oil is high, the pressures are high, but not too high, the yields are good, and the process is reasonably fast. Using solvents can make things tricky and expensive, so this method has not really gotten the attention it deserves, but it is a very effective way of turning biomass into a high-quality bio-oil suitable for use in a petroleum refinery or further upgrading to fuels. Torrefaction and charcoal production are the versions of pyrolysis that aim to generate solid products instead of liquids. These solid products can be very valuable, so the pyrolysis process is optimized to produce as much of the desired solid as possible. Torrefaction and charcoal production are very attractive small-scale processes because they can burn the pyrolysis vapors to supply all of the heat needed for the conversion. As long as fresh biomass can continue to be added to the process, it is largely self-sustaining, which is great. Dry biomass goes in and biochar comes out. Very simple compared to many other processes. 
Torrefaction is done at 300 to 400 degrees Celsius and produces a low temperature biochar good for combustion. However, biochar for soils is done at higher temperatures of 500 to 700 degrees Celsius for increased surface area. Remember the pyrolysis graph. The production of biochar has technically always been a big business. All of the potting soil you buy at Home Depot and Lowe's has had to be cooked at high temperatures and pressures to make it clean and sterile so that it doesn't grow weeds or have pests in it. That potting soil is largely composed of woody materials, sand and other fillers, perlite, and some nutrients. It does not provide anything magical for a plant, it just gives it soil with no competition and lots of surface area, and the right kind of surface chemistry. It just so happens that cooking potting soil to make it sterile is a lot like pyrolysis, so along those lines, biochar produced from pyrolysis ends up being sterile just like potting soil. This means you could technically use pyrolysis to produce potting soil components and generate bio-oils as a byproduct you could turn into fuels. This is a compelling business model that is being developed by a company called Cool Planet Biofuels. Their primary goal is to produce a high-quality potting soil or soil amendment, and fuels are a secondary product because they've chosen to convert the bio-oils to fuel instead of burning them for heat. It is a very interesting and exciting way to use biomass pyrolysis because it does not compete directly with oil companies, it can be done economically at a very small scale, and it leverages many of the natural strengths of biomass. Thank goodness for pyrolysis because it's delicious. By right, we shouldn't be eating too much smoked food because it's bad for us but that delicious smoky flavor is the product of pyrolysis, and things like liquid smoke and barbecue sauce definitely require wood pyrolysis vapors to be made. Equally important is the charcoal. We have been doing commercial biomass pyrolysis for charcoal briquette production since the days of Henry Ford and the Model T. The charcoal that we have all used at a backyard barbecue sometime or another was generated using the exact same pyrolysis technologies that the bioenergy industry is currently utilizing to generate fuels and chemicals. I find it reassuring that this process has been economically practiced for so long with biomass, because it is evidence that it can be done if careful attention is given to the source of biomass and the target product. When you have a chance, please visit the attached link. This is a very neat hydrogen peroxide technology. Catalytic decomposition of hydrogen peroxide is a very powerful oxidation tool, capable of degrading biomass and organic matter. Plant tissue degradation by advanced oxidation with catalyzed hydrogen peroxide is shown in the image, and this degradation occurs in about two hours. The idea of using reactive oxygen as singlet oxygen, ozone, and hydroxyl radicals has been around for decades, and it is very powerful chemistry. The interesting thing about hydrogen peroxide processes is that they can be done at room temperature and without pressure. You could easily break down biomass into its chemical pieces right in your kitchen. That's certainly worth thinking about.